It's good to be with you again as we uh, continue our study through the book of Acts. Uh, we are in chapter 7, about halfway through. Let's open up our Bibles to Acts chapter 7. And, um, you know, as Aaron was sharing, you know, just the, the promise that God's not going to destroy the world with a flood uh, again. Next time it's with fire. So, um, you know, we have a lot to pray about, a lot of people to reach out to in these last days before Christ comes for his bride. And um, then the great tribulation is coming. So uh, we don't want to be like these stubborn religious people we see in Acts chapter 7. We want to be like Stephen, uh, standing for righteousness, standing up for Jesus. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again, as we come before you, we thank you for your word. We thank you for um, just your grace in our lives. We thank you for being here in our midst. We ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts, draw us near to you, uh, give us ears to hear what your Spirit is saying to us, and thank you for the challenging words that we have here in Acts chapter 7. Uh, may we humble ourselves before you, and uh, Lord, if there's any self-righteousness in us, Lord, we pray that you'd purge that out of our lives. Uh, we want to just be uh, vessels of honor in your hands for your glory, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so we're in Acts chapter 7, about halfway through. Um, we've been looking at Stephen, this born-again table waiter who was being used by God in amazing ways. Uh, we saw in chapter 6, verse 8, that Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he did great wonders and signs in the midst of the people there. And as we saw, he started out being faithful in the little things that God called him to do. And then God now opens up other doors for him, and he's being faithful to go through those other doors. And he's being used in greater ways. As we'll see, the, the greater opportunities that God gives us, uh, the greater the potential uh, of becoming a target for the enemy. Because Satan does not want the light shining. He does not want us standing up for Christ. He wants us to be quiet about our faith. And so with increased responsibilities, there comes an increase in on, on our part in counting the cost of what God has done in us and what God wants to do through our lives. And Stephen, he was used to do great wonders and signs among the people, but it was going to cost him. It was going to cost him his life. Uh, Jesus says in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. And so Stephen, he is sold out to Jesus. He's just going for it. He began preaching the gospel to the people. And then certain men began to uh, stir up trouble against Stephen. They bring him before the religious leaders, you know, the Sanhedrin and the, the other religious leaders there in, in Jerusalem. And they put him on trial. They accuse him falsely of speaking against Moses and the law in the temple, blaspheming the name of God. Again, these were outright lies. Uh, Stephen loved God with all of his heart. Um, as far as the temple was concerned, you know, he's giving the right interpretation of why there were sacrifices at the temple, but he's going to let us know Jesus is the final sacrifice. We don't need the temple. Jesus is the ultimate lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's not speaking against the law. He's going to let us know that Jesus has come not to destroy it, but to fulfill the law. And so he's not coming against these things. He is totally supporting these things. But Jesus came to fulfill all the Old Testament law and prophets. Now, they were the ones that were really put on trial by Stephen. And he speaks of the truth of their past dealings with the prophets God would send them, uh, the, the leaders God would send them. And he started last time talking about Joseph, how they rejected Joseph the first time, but then they received him the second time. We saw how they rejected Moses the first time, they would receive him the second time. Same with Jesus, that they rejected Jesus the first time he came, but they will receive him when he returns at his second coming. So we left off with Stephen giving a, a, you know, a history lesson about Moses, a, a lesson they all were very familiar with. Uh, Moses, as we saw, was trained in the ways of Egypt for the first 40 years of his life. He was basically a prince of Egypt. 
He takes it on his, uh, takes it into his own hands. He sees this Egyptian beating up a, a Jewish man, and so he strikes down the Egyptian, thinking, "Oh, they'll understand. I'm the deliverer." And because of what he did, Pharaoh says, "I'm going to kill Moses." So he flees to Midian, and he'll spend the next 40 years in Midian, and it'll be there he becomes a sheep herder, and for his father-in-law Jethro. But it's during those 40 years where God's really humbling him, bringing him to the end of himself. And so let's pick up in chapter 7, verse 30, where it tells us, And when 40 years had passed, and so now he's 80 years old, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. And so once again, at 80 years old, it's like God says, Now I can use you, Moses. Uh, possibly Moses had too much pride when he was younger. Uh, a lot of people, you know, when we're young and we have that physical strength, we think we can do it. We can push through these things. But through age or injury, we start to realize, I just need to lean on the strength of the Lord. You know, I can't rely on my own strength. I need the strength of Jesus. Also, like Moses, many people place their trust in their intellect, maybe their mental abilities, um, but again, through circumstances and time, we realize God's ways are so much higher, so much better than my ways. So I've got to start trusting Him and not my own resources. As we read in Exodus chapter 3, God appeared to Moses in a flaming, fiery bush. We know the voice was the Lord Himself, Yahweh. Ultimately, we'll find out that was Jesus speaking to Moses at that time. Now look at verse 31. When Moses saw this burning bush, he marveled at the sight, and as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Now I love this because the, the ground he's standing on, it's just dirt. But why is it holy ground? Because the presence of God was there. That's what makes it holy. You know, a lot of people think, oh, the church, that's a holy place. No, it's not. It's just a building. What makes it holy are the people inside that are filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what makes it a holy place. Look at the church of Laodicea in the book of Revelation. It's not a holy place because Jesus is outside the church. He's knocking. If anybody will hear my voice, open the door, I'll come into him. So it wasn't a holy place because it was a church. A holy place is where the presence of God's people are. Now, think about this. Just as God says to Moses, the dirt you're standing on is holy ground, we're made up, you and me, our bodies, it's made up of the same 17 elements as common dirt. That should keep you humble. You know, I'm just a dirt clod. Or you're a dust bunny, whatever you want, whatever you want to go as. But we're made up of the exact same elements as common dirt. And it's only because of the presence of God in our lives that anything good is happening in and through our lives. Jesus is the potter. We're the clay. He's molding us and shaping us into the image and likeness of Christ. He's wanting to do a good work in us and through us. But that's exactly what the Lord did with the first man, Adam. He was just a, a fistful of dirt in God's hands. It says in Genesis 2, verse 7, and the Lord God formed man, Adam, of the dust or dirt of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And the same is true today. Without the breath of God, the Holy Spirit within us, there were nothing but just common, ordinary dirt. But what a difference Jesus makes in a person's life. He touches us, he molds us, he shapes us when we receive him. He comes into our lives, and now we are alive with the Lord. The old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Our sins are forgiven. Our hearts are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. He makes us alive, we who were once dead, in our trespasses and sins. And best of all, we come into a personal relationship with the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And that is amazing beyond comprehension. So here in Acts 7.33... Moses has come into the very presence of God. That's why it's holy ground. Verse 34, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. Now, the exact same thing is true today. God hears your groaning. He hears your moaning. He knows your suffering. 
you know, as people fight and struggle with the effects of sin, both personal sin and just sin in this world, people are downcast, people are discouraged, they're getting beat up by the enemy, and yet the Lord knows and He cares. The whole reason Jesus came down from earth, or from heaven to earth, was to deliver us from the penalty of our sin and the power of sin. You know, this is what He says in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. Remember, they, he's in the synagogue in Nazareth. They hand him a scroll of the book of Isaiah. He unrolls it to the place, what we would call Isaiah 61. And he, I love it because he's quoting himself out of the Old Testament. And Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. And this is why he came, to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Anybody have a broken heart in here? Well, he's here to heal your broken heart. To proclaim liberty to the captives. Are you in captivity to anything of this world? He wants to set you free. Recovery of sight to the blind. If you don't see your need for Christ, he wants to open your eyes so you see he is alive, risen from the dead. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. You don't need to remain oppressed and discouraged and depressed by the things of this world. He wants to set you free and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now notice that last sentence in verse 34. It's extremely important here because the Lord says, And now come, I will send you to Egypt. Again, the first time Moses, in his own strength, in his own flesh, he strikes down the Egyptian thinking, I'm going to be the deliverer. But now God says, no, you can't do it. I will do it in you. I will do it through you. And we see what God would do through Moses. The results would be not just one Egyptian enemy struck down. The entire army of Egypt will drown in the Red Sea at God's doing. Moses was just a vessel. He's just an instrument in God's hands. God would use him in amazing ways. And oh, how much we can accomplish when we walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. In the same conversation from uh, Exodus chapter 3, when God tells him, I'm going to send you, I will do this in you and through you, Moses gets into this conversation with the Lord. Okay, when I go there, they're going to ask, who sent you? What am I going to say? What's your name? You know, and this is how God responds in Exodus 3, 14. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Again, the eternal name of God. I am everything you will ever need. He will supply whatever you need. You need salvation? He's the only one that can give it. You need your sins forgiven? He's the only one that can do it. You can't, but God can. Jesus takes his name to himself. Remember when uh, he's talking there in John, I think it's 858, and uh, he says, before Abraham was, I am. And they take up stones to stone him. What are you stoning me for? For what good work? Not for any good work, but because you, being a man, make yourself God. The Jews knew exactly what Jesus was claiming. Co-equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Jesus would say, before Abraham was, I am. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the light of the world. He is the great I am. In fact, in John 8, 24, it's not on the screen, but I encourage you to write it down. If anybody comes knocking on your door, JWs especially, I always leave them because you, you usually don't get very far with them, and then I get upset. It's like, oh, you're blaspheming the name of Jesus. You're saying he's a created being. You're saying he's Michael the Archangel. So I leave him with John 8, 24. Unless you believe that I am, you'll die in your sins. And they'll say, thank you, bye. I mean, wrestle with that. I have had people come back and say, you know what? I really started looking at that. Unless you believe that I am. You'll see he in the italics that's not in the original. Jesus says, unless you believe that I am, you'll die in your sins. That, that, that's the ultimate. He is the ultimate. He's the only way of salvation. Now look at verse 35. So here's Stephen standing before all these people that are listening very intently. At this point, they're all agreeing with him. He says, this Moses, whom they rejected, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge? is the one God sent to be a ruler and deliverer by the hand of the angel, the angel, that would be Jesus, who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out 
after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years, this is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, him you shall hear. This is very important because here he is talking about Jesus Christ. He's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. That's exactly what Moses said. I'm going to, God's going to raise up a prophet just like me. Him you shall hear, and it's referring to Jesus. Peter quotes the same verse back in chapter 3, referring to Jesus Christ. And so this is a clear reference and an awesome prophecy that is speaking of Jesus as Messiah. So Stephen here is planting seeds in their minds that Jesus is the prophet that Moses spoke of. He's the voice from the burning bush, verse 38. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey but rejected. And in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. This is while they're wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. They get out there, they start grumbling and complaining that, you know, they were moaning and groaning. First of all, we're slaves in Egypt. God delivers them. Then they start moaning and groaning. We want to go back to Egypt. So heartbreaking. Uh, this is a great definition of what a backslider looks like. One who has been set free, but then they start longing for the things of the world once again. With the Jewish people that were in the wilderness, they start grumbling, complaining against Moses. They end up staying out there for 40 years. The whole first generation had to die off, except for Joshua and Caleb, the only two of the original that went into the promised land. And that whole second generation was able to enter in. The first generation, they could not enter in because of unbelief. The results are the same today as it was for the first generation of Jews that wandered in the wilderness with Moses. They weren't allowed to enter into the promised land because of unbelief. If you as a Christian are in a backslidden state, you're not going to experience the promised land of the abundant life, the Holy Spirit-filled life. You're not going to see the Lord open up doors of opportunity for you because you're going to be so consumed with the things of this world, you're not on fire for the things of God. Don't be that fence hitter. Don't be that you know, person that's jumping from one side to the other. James 1, 7 and 8 says, For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Again, the proverbial fence sitter. Too much in the world to be of any use for the kingdom of God, but too much in the kingdom of God to have any joy in this world. That's a miserable place to be. God wants you sold out to Him. Jesus tells the church of Laodicea in Revelation 3.16, you're neither cold nor hot, so then because you're, you're neither uh, no, so then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I, I hate reading that verse right before lunch, but that's what Jesus says. He doesn't want you lukewarm. He wants you on fire for Jesus, not double-minded. So this is Stephen's whole point in going through the history of the Jewish people with these Jewish leaders is to show them the hardness of their hearts. This is nothing new. Rejection of God's plan, rejection of God's purposes, rejection of God's prophets, His people. It's nothing new. It's throughout their history. All the way up to rejecting God's only begotten Son, the true Messiah, Jesus. It's just been the pattern. And it's no different in our country. It's a pattern of American Christians. You know, we were on fire for the Lord years and years ago, but where are we today? It's no different than the Israelites back in the day. They had it all. God was there in their midst. Even Elijah, he had that Elijah complex. I'm the last prophet. God's like, no, you're not. I got 7,000 more that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. God's always got a remnant. He's, always, he's got a remnant in our country as well. And so he doesn't want us being this wishy-washy Christian. He wants us on fire for Jesus. Look at verse 40. 
So he's going on and he says, this is what the people are saying to Aaron, make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has, hap- uh, what has become of him. Again, he's up on Mount Sinai getting the Ten Commandments and the other you know, instructions for the tabernacle and all these things. And they're down below. We don't know what happened to him. So make us a calf, a gold calf. So they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in their, the work of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven as it is written in the book of the prophets. Now he's quoting from Amos. So he's covering a lot of territory from when they made the gold calf in the wilderness to all the rebellion, rejection of God. The ten northern tribes have been taken into captivity. The tribe of Judah and Benjamin, they're about to be taken into Babylon. So he's going through hundreds of years, summarizing it in these verses here. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? Yeah, they did. You also, though, this is the bad thing, you also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Rephan. Rephidim is some versions. Images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. And so, again, truly amazing that after all that God did in setting his people free, from the bondage of Egypt, sending the the ten plagues upon Pharaoh, uh, the tenth plague being the death of the firstborn, the the death angel passes over, sees all the houses that have the blood on the lintel and the doorpost, the blood of the lamb. When he saw the blood of the lamb, he passed over, everybody spared, but the death of the firstborn was the tenth plague. Then the exodus takes place, He parts the Red Sea. They go on dry land. He kills all the Egyptian army. They're out there in the wilderness. He gives them manna from heaven, water from the rock. Their sandals don't wear out for 40 years. That's a good pair of Tevas right there. You know, God did all these amazing things. A cloud of fire by night, the pillar of cloud by day. They had it all. God's in their midst, miracle after miracle, every single day of their lives. And yet, time and time again, the masses of people kept turning to pagan worship. They did not give the glory to the Lord, the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now again, we as born-again Christians need to guard our hearts. We need to be very careful not to fall into the same pattern. Because we do. It's so easy to fall into these same old habits and we start drifting away, and we start clinging to the things of the world. Some of you are looking at your watch. I wonder how the Broncos are doing. It's the first quarter, and uh, they're going to lose, folks. (laughs) I'm not being a prophet, by the way. No, I mean, but we get caught up in so many things, and so we need to be very, very careful and very, very diligent to hold fast to that pure, simple devotion in Jesus that Paul talks about to the Corinthians. Nothing in this world is worth risking your relationship with Jesus over. No drug, no relationship, no person, no amount of money is worth it if it hinders your relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus, as we just sang, he wants all of us. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Not, here's this little room in my heart, Lord. The rest of it's mine. No, he wants us to give everything over to him. That's the only way you're going to experience his joy, his peace, his plans and purposes for your life. Verse 44. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. Again, he's not speaking against the temple or the tabernacle. He's not speaking against the law or Moses. He's defending them. I mean, but they had a wrong interpretation of what these things meant. He says, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land promised by the Gentile, possessed by the Gentiles, promised to the Israelites, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David. So he goes from the time Joshua brings him into the promised land to David wanting to build a temple. And then he says, David, who found favor before God, asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob, but Solomon built him a house, the temple. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says, here he quotes from Isaiah 66, Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool, 
What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? In other words, if God appeared to Moses in a bush, no temple is any great thing for God. You know, if God can put his feet on the earth, it's his footstool, you think a temple is going to be, oh, that's what I'm really looking forward to, having a temple of my own, a house to dwell in. No, God's not impressed with that. He's not impressed with church buildings. He desires to dwell in our hearts. By the way, when people are gathered together with Jesus in their hearts, do you know what that's called? Church. <laughs> it's not the building. Oh, we're going to church. No, we are the church. That's simply where people are walking in the Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, living for the Lord, getting into His Word, you know, worshiping Him. That's what church is all about. As much as man is impressed by their church buildings, God's not really that impressed. What impresses God is when we come together and we worship Him in spirit and truth. And we expectantly wait for the Lord to touch our lives, to empower us, to fill us up, to use us for His glory. Now, again, never did uh, Stephen speak against the beautiful Jewish temple in Jerusalem, but he's simply reminding these religious leaders what the true temple is and where God desires to dwell. Not in a place made by human hands, but He wants to dwell in our hearts. That's why Paul says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is where God dwells today. And He wants to clean out our hearts. He wants to beautify our lives. He wants to mold us and shape us more and more into the image and likeness of Jesus. And so the real issue is, will you let Jesus dwell in your heart? Will you allow Him access into every area of your life? In other words, will you turn your life completely over to Christ Allow Him to be your Lord and Savior. If you're not willing, then you're no different than these religious leaders who are in rebellion against God. That's what Stephen is saying. If you're, if you're not willing to yield yourself to the Lord, then you're no different. It doesn't really mean a thing if you say, Oh, I love Jesus, I love God, I'm a Christian, but you're living in out-and-out -out sin and rebellion against God. You're fooling yourself. Jesus says the same thing. Look at these verses in Matthew 7, starting in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? A lot of people like to throw the name of Jesus around in Jesus' name, and they do all these phony, weird things. They give false prophecies. You'll see them up here at 28 and a quarter road, by the way, in Patterson. They're going to build another bigger place down off of I-70. They're going to have Jesse Duplantis come in, another false prophet. They constantly bring in, and it's all around us, and it's growing. Come against these things. Speak the truth, because they're false prophets. God did not say to Jesse Duplantis, my people are going to give you $54 million so you can buy a private jet. God told him to say that to everybody, to make them feel guilty if they don't give. Jesus didn't tell him that. I mean, we have so many that are throwing his name around there, out there. He says, Lord, Lord, have we not? prophesied, cast out demons, done many wonders in your name. Here's the saddest verse in the, in the Bible. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Those who are ripping people off, building bigger and better castles for themselves. You know, Kenneth Copeland is one of the worst prophets out there. He is a liar. He's a false teacher. Don't listen to him. Don't give anything to him. He has ripped people off for years and years. He'll go to the hospital, but he won't let anybody know he's had to go to the hospital for a procedure because he has enough faith. Well, he'll be healed. These guys are charlatans. Don't buy into it. Not everyone who says these things. Jesus says of these type of people in Matthew 15, verses 7 through 9, hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips. They say all the right things, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Most of these doctrines, these false teachers throughout there, you won't find them in the Bible. 
because they're commandments of men. They're doctrines of demons. They're not from the Word of God. So be careful. Too many people are not willing to listen to and obey God's Word of truth that He's given us here in black and white and red letters, if you have a red letter edition. They want something new. They want something that will tickle their ears. They want something that will make them feel good. Pat me on the back and make me feel like my sins are okay. That's not the Word of God. That's not the Holy Spirit. Be careful. His Word is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Stephen, (laughs) he becomes the first martyr for a reason. He's speaking the truth in love, and they're going to come against him here in just a moment. Check this out. Verse 51. If you think he's been harsh up to this point, he looks at these religious leaders And he certainly didn't, you know, read that book, How to Make Friends and Influence People. I don't, never read it myself, don't want to read it, but this is what Stephen has to say. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? I mean, think of Isaiah. It says he was sawn in two. Jeremiah was thrown in a dungeon. They didn't want to hear it. So many of God's prophets, they ran out of town. They didn't want to hear the word of truth that God was speaking through his prophets. And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, speaking of Jesus, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. You have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. So the problem is not the law. Its problem is they weren't living according to God's word. They were doing their own thing, trying to justify themselves. So he just lays it out. You're no different than your forefathers who killed God's prophets. They rejected Moses. They rejected Joseph. You rejected Jesus, the one these prophets spoke about. Talk about boldness, boldness that God gave to Stephen. Stephen is the one who's on trial here, but in a sense, he's put them on trial. Stephen is the one who says to these religious leaders, uncircumcised in heart and ears. Now to call these religious leaders of the Jewish faith uncircumcised in any fashion It's basically saying you're no different than the pagan Gentiles out there. You're uncircumcised in ears and in your heart. That's these are fighting words, and we'll see they did not like what he had to say whatsoever. But their sinful hearts were still unclean, even though they were ceremonially circumcised. It's no different. I've baptized people before. And then I'll hear later on, oh yeah, now they're back living in the world. Now they're back sinning. They're just living it up in the world. It's like, that baptism didn't do me any good. Baptism doesn't save you. Circumcision doesn't save anybody. It's what's in your heart. That's what he wants. And, and you th- see it throughout the Old Testament where God says, I want circumcised hearts. Not just a physical circumcision. I want the heart circumcised. I want your heart, cut, the flesh cut away from your heart. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 2, starting in verse 25. Paul writes, you know, again, Paul, Hebrew of Hebrews, tribe of Benjamin. He says, all these things, I count them but a pile of rubbish because I know Jesus now. He's the fulfillment of all these things. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law, but if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you, who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. The circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. And so Paul laid it out very clearly. God wants our heart, first and foremost. If he's got your heart, everything else will fall into place. But don't think I can keep doing my own thing without Jesus. Be careful. 
Stephen, uh, I love this because he's being very, very bold. He's speaking the truth, but again, he's speaking the truth in love. But God gave him this boldness. And we should not be afraid to tell people about Christ. You know, Romans 1.16, God is not, uh, or he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek or Gentiles. It's the power of the gospel. Jesus made things very clear in John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Not all roads lead to heaven. Only one road leads to heaven, and that's Jesus Christ. So speak the truth in love. Our lost family members and friends need to hear the truth about their separation from God, but Jesus loved them so much He died for them. He shed His blood for their sins. And He rose from the grave. And because He's alive, He can give eternal life to anyone who will come to Him by faith. Now, look at verse 54. After He has said these things to them. Well, I, I, yeah. Look at, so he, he lays it out there. You stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart and ears. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. That literally means they became furious and they gnashed at him with their teeth. In other words, the truth of God's word has pierced their hearts and, and they're so convicted by the Holy Spirit. Instead of humbling themselves before God, they do what I used to do before I got saved. I would get mad. I would start yelling. I'd start screaming. I never picked up a rock and started trying to kill him, but you know I would just go crazy because I didn't want to hear the truth. And so they snarl at him. They're growling at him. They're just so filled with bitterness. And so they're cut to the heart. But he, verse 55, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus, notice, standing at the right hand of God and said... Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. What a glorious vision he has of, of the Lord. He sees Jesus. Most everywhere you read of Jesus in the Bible, he's seated at the right hand of the Father, seated at the right hand of glory. But here, Stephen's about to become the first martyr of the faith the trust in Christ, and it's like Jesus stands up. He stands up and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You're willing to stand up for me, I'm going to stand up for you. I can picture Jesus standing up for all those who give their life to Christ in this way. He stands up to receive Stephen as he's about to be stoned and put to death. Amazing. Psalm 32, verse 7 says, You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. You know, the same is true for all of God's people. When the enemy is all around us, when we get surrounded by the evil of this world, look up, lift up your heads, your redemption draws near, but make sure you look up high enough to see the Lord. You know, I think back to when in the book of Numbers, when uh, they talk Moses into sending in the 12 spies, he says, okay, go in. They look in all of the land. They're spying out the land, the promised land. Ten come back. Oh, we can't do it. We're like grasshoppers. There's giants in the land. They're going to crush us. And it was only Joshua and Caleb that looked higher. I don't know how big the giants were. Let's say they're eight feet high. They looked higher than that. They saw the Lord. And Joshua and Caleb are the ones that say, we can take the land. God's given it to us. Wherever we put our feet, he's going to give us the land. They had that faith. But the other ones, they stopped short. They just looked at the giants. Make sure when you're surrounded by the enemy, when things are coming against you, you don't just look at the problem. Don't just look at the circumstances. Look to the Lord, who is infinitely greater, more powerful than anything else. Here's Stephen. He looks up. I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Amazing. Verse 57. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran, with, uh, ran at him 
with one accord. So some of us can remember when our kids were little and you told them something they didn't want to hear. La, 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 la. I mean, that's what it means. They stop their ears. They don't want to hear what he's saying about Jesus. They don't want to hear what he's saying. I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So they close their ears. They just run after him. They cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. We'll read a lot more about Saul in the coming weeks because this is Saul of Tarsus. Again, he was probably a member of the Sanhedrin. He was agreeing to put Stephen to death. And we'll look at him in more detail because he approved of this death. He says, I voted to have people put to death. I had people locked up. I had people imprisoned. I mean, he was a bad dude. And yet we know what happens in chapter 9 when the Lord Jesus gets a hold of him. So they lay the feet at the feet of a young man, their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, and they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. What an amazing scene this is. His, in his death, he was so much like Jesus. I don't know if I would be that gracious. Lord, don't hold this sin against them. Don't charge them with this sin. It's like Jesus. When they raised him up on the cross, first thing out of his mouth was, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Even as Jesus gave up the ghost, you know, it says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And that's the same thing he says here. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And the last thing there, it says, and he fell asleep. Doesn't mean he went into soul sleep. That's not a biblical teaching. When we die, physically, instantly, we're in the presence of the Lord. You take your last breath on earth, so to speak, you take your first breath in heaven. There is no such thing as soul sleep. We don't just stop, you know, cease to exist until the rapture or the resurrection. You immediately go to be with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says, We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So as soon as he dies, Lord, receive my spirit, and he was instantly in the presence of Jesus. That's true for every one of us who know him as our Lord and Savior. That's why you don't die. Literally, we none of us die. Physically, yeah, this will die, but the real you, your spirit, because you're born again, you're with Jesus. You'll never be separated from God. That's what death is, a separation from God. But we'll never be separated from God. In fact, look at these verses. I'll close with this in John chapter 11. You're familiar with these verses. Usually we read these verses during Resurrection Sunday season. It says in verse 23, now the story, remember, uh, Lazarus dies and Martha sends you know, people down, go get Jesus, tell him Lazarus is sick. And it says Jesus is down by the Jordan River, a long ways away. And it says he chose to wait two more days down by the Jordan River. And they're like, don't we need to get up there? You, you know, Lazarus is sick. He goes, no, 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 he's fine. He's dead. Oh, if, or no, first they say, oh, he's asleep. Oh, if he's sleeping, he'll wake up. No, no, he's dead, he says. And so he waits. He gets there, and it's been four days since Lazarus died. And they're like, oh, Lord, don't tell us to roll away a stone. By now he stinks. You know, Jesus is waiting for him to get nice and ripe. And so Jesus tells Martha, chapter 11, verse 23, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, here's one of those I am statements, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Now notice this, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into this world, so you'll never die if you believe in Jesus. Again, Death is separation from God because we are born again. Our spirit is forever alive in Christ. When our physical body goes down, our spirit goes up. Never to be separated from God. You'll never die. So for us, death is moving day. I love what Pastor Chuck used to say as he's getting older. He goes, one of these days you're going to read in the newspaper, Pastor Chuck has died. That's bad reporting. 
I didn't die, I just moved. And that's true for all of us. And that's true for Stephen. Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he was taken up into the presence of the Lord. And Jesus is there welcoming him in glory. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Jesus tells the persecuted church of Smyrna, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. The word crown is Stephanos. Stephen, that's his Greek name, is Stephanos. That's why this last two weeks it was called Stephanos, the crown of life. He received the crown of life. We will receive the crown of life. And we'll take our crowns that the Lord gives us, however many crowns you get, and we'll cast them at his feet, because he alone is worthy to receive all the praise and glory and honor. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for this great example of this simple servant, this some call him a table waiter, this first deacon in the church, the first martyr. Lord, he was so full of the Holy Spirit and, he, and we see he was so full of the Word of God that the Holy Spirit just brought these scriptures to mind and he just shared the truth in love with those who were coming against him. And Lord, we thank you for that example. He was not ashamed to die for you, to lay down his life for you. And Lord, you were not ashamed to stand up and greet him as he came into your presence. And Lord, we thank you for the promise of your word. We thank you, Lord, that a day is coming when the dead in Christ will rise first. That's when they receive their resurrection bodies. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet you in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Lord, I pray until that time that you come for us, when you come for your bride, that we would be filled up overflowing with your Holy Spirit. We would truly be light and salt to those around us. We would not compromise in our relationship with you. We would not compromise with the things of this world that, try to, that tries to entangle us and, and keep us in bondage. Lord, we want to walk in the freedom that you have given us. We want to proclaim the truth of your word to those who will hear. And Lord, thank you that you are so gracious, so merciful, that you would save us. And Lord, that you would change us from sinners into saints. Yes, we are saints and we still sin, but thank you, Lord, that we are new creations in Christ. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And Lord, we still stumble. We still fall short. We still get in the flesh from time to time. But Lord, that's not how we want to be known. We want to be known as those who walk in your grace and in your love with compassion towards those around us because none of us are perfect. But we thank you, Jesus, that you are our perfect Lord and Savior. And as we yield ourselves to you once again, may your spirit refill us, overflowing with your love, your joy, your peace. Lord, that we would have that fruit produced in abundance in all of our lives so that those around us can truly see Christ at work in us. What an amazing Lord you are. And we give you all the glory for what you've started because, Lord, you began this good work in us and it's you, Lord, who will complete it until that day when we see you face to face. And so as we go our separate ways today, Father, may you encourage us through your word. May you help us to rely upon your strength and the power of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, those times when we start to slip back into the flesh, remind us so quickly of the futility of trying to make it happen in our own strength. Lord, we love you and we thank you that you first loved us and you would save us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.